Hello and welcome back to Retro Ranger. In 1995, if you were an RPG fan, you couldn't escape the juggernaut on the Super Nintendo called Chrono Trigger. It's still covered by many as one of the best role-playing games of all time. Five years later, we get the much-anticipated follow-up called Chrono Cross. I remember this release well as I was definitely in the bunch impatiently waiting, but when it came out there was a lot of disappointment over the loose ties to Chrono Trigger, at least in the beginning. As time went on, people began to wake up, including myself, to the fact that Chrono Cross, even as a standalone, is an amazing RPG and absolutely worth a playthrough, or more. Recently, a remastered edition of the game was released, and I think it's a great catalyst to cover this truly interesting game and talk about some of the differences between it and the original. Fair warning though, there will be spoilers. Let's jump in. Welcome to Chrono Cross. The main character of the game is Surge, this blue-haired teenager. He won't talk much during the game, basically acting as a vessel for the player, and the only times you'll see his dialogue is the decisions that you, as the player, make throughout the game. In Chrono Trigger, the game orbited around the mechanic of time travel, where you would go back and forth on a wide time spectrum over the course of the game. In this sequel, time travel gets a rest in favor of a concept around two parallel worlds that you'll be bouncing between. As the game opens, Surge is pulled into an alternate and parallel world, only in this world Surge is dead, and none of his friends or family will believe who he says he is now. won't be long before you stumble upon a spunky girl named Kid, who quickly tags along, well potentially, and joins your party as your objectives become aligned. It appears that someone is already wise to the fact that Surge is here in this other world, and both Surge and Kid can team up in their journey to understand why and the reason for the splitting of the worlds. I said Kid potentially joins you, as that's another large mechanic of Chrono Cross. There are some big branches in terms of gameplay that revolve around who joins and who is in your party at any given time. You could choose not to join up with Kid at this time and go it alone, and the events of which happen later will change as a result. There's a few of these branches, some of which entail more than just two paths. Another gameplay mechanic is that as you move between these worlds, actions you take in one can affect what happens in the others, or sometimes the differences can just be a catalyst to switch between. A great example of this early on is that Kid becomes sick and you have a decision to make about whether or not you want to save her. Doing so will not be easy, as it turns out the only antidote comes from an extinct creature. However, in the other world, this creature still exists, so sticking exclusively to just one of these worlds will not suffice. 
Before we jump back to the story, it's also worth mentioning that you can recruit many characters, up to 45 in fact, though it's not possible to collect them all in a single playthrough and needs to rely on a New Game Plus experience to do that as you'll be forced to make some choices that only allow you to collect certain characters in a single go. Some of these will join you automatically and others will require a side quest. Let's cover combat really quick. Your party will contain up to three characters at a time, and battles like in Chrono Trigger are not random, but rather you see the enemies on the screen and can try to avoid them if you'd like. Combat Flow retains the turn-based action and introduces a stamina meter in favor of the action timer of the original game. There's also an element grid that you'll see in the upper left-hand corner, and that represents the last three colors of the skills or spells cast, and there's numerous spells to manipulate that grid for various purposes. Lastly, it's probably time to cover the graphics component of the remaster as you've now been seeing some of the upgrades. It is indeed a remaster and not a remake, an important distinction, and if you've played the Final Fantasy VIII remaster, that's pretty close to the treatment here. The character models, textures, and some effects have all been upgraded. It's a fine upgrade, but there's also some spots that were neglected as well, and that's a bit disappointing to have only done some and not all. There's more to the remaster that we'll cover later, but for now, let's get back to the story. Through an altercation from some henchmen and conversing with folks in a nearby town, Surge and Kid learn that their next destination is the Viper's Manor, home of the region's military leader known as General Viper, and more importantly, Lynx, a seemingly more influential shadow character of whom we've seen brief and disconnected cutscenes on thus far. Kid is seeking some mystical artifact called the Frozen Flame, and she believes it lives here as well. They stage a break-in at the manor and in doing so, recruiting more allies to the party and choosing one of three possible storylines that diverge around how to get into the manor. Inside, Surge meets the Prophet of Time and gets his confirmation that two worlds now exist, one in which is a timeline where he died. We also get confirmation that Lynx is no mere pawn in the game, and is one that is actually seeking Surge, and knows a bit too much of the parallel worlds, Surge's presence in this world, and hints of something much more grandiose. After Kid is wounded and poisoned in a daring escape, the same sickness mentioned earlier, we really see the world opened up where you can explore the vast world, or I should say worlds, plural, since a special amulet from Kid now lets you switch between the worlds at your whim. Following the trail, our heroic party reconvenes with Lynx and General Viper at Fort Dragonia where things really start to escalate. Lynx murders the general, not having to play in the shadows any longer, and then, using another mythical artifact called the Dragon's Tear, Lynx switches bodies with Surge.
With Kid confused as to what just happened, she's stabbed, and the disconnected cutscenes from the very beginning of the game come back full circle to understand the premonition. Surge is banished to a place called the Temporal Vortex, and Kid is now manipulated to join forces with Lynx, now in Surge's body. Okay, pausing the action for a moment, let's quickly talk about some more remastered differences, namely the controls. Of course, this mainly consists of mapping the PS1 controller to the Switch controller, pretty basic and intuitive, but we also get a few more controls at our disposal over the original. First, we have the fast forward option, which is unfortunately common in a lot of these remasters, remakes, and just re-releases. I won't go into why I think they're awful, but if you like them, that's cool, it's here for you. You can also disable encounters in this edition, which again, I think isn't for the better, but of course it's optional and it's up to the player. I mentioned the graphics before, and the one thing to add is the user interface. Specifically, the text interactions are touched up to be super crisp, which all look really nice, and can be seen in the title, menu, and dialogue throughout. Okay, getting back to the story, and not to be deterred by losing his own body and banished to a strange world, Surge, the real Surge in Lynx's body that is, befriends some more allies and escapes from the Temporal Vortex. This is bittersweet, as all of his previous allies now jump ship since he now appears to be the enemy Lynx. Further, Surge, again in Lynx's body, is unable to now switch between worlds anymore. What's left to do other than take on the mission to reclaim his rightful body and uncover more of the mystery of our diverging worlds? Surge, as Lynx, leads his newer band of allies into a frozen sea that captures ruins of a different time period referred to as the Dead Sea. There they meet Miguel, father of Surge's childhood friend and also the friend of his own father. There's numerous tie-ins to Chrono Trigger at this point, but the consolidated version is that each decision made creates and collapses a potential parallel world of the implications of those decisions, the chosen one acting as the trigger of those events, aka the Chrono Trigger. It's very existential, but it works in theme for the two games of the series. There's also another tie-in to the direct events of Chrono Trigger, mentioning Lavos and the eventual success of Chrono and his friends. It's also important to mention that we learn of an entity called Fate, which is charged Miguel with protecting the frozen flame within the Dead Sea. This of course means that we have to fight him, and upon winning, Fate then destroys the Dead Sea to prevent Surge from obtaining that flame. After a narrow escape, one big progression that we did make through all of this is regaining the ability to travel through worlds again. This is important as we need to do just that to collect dragon relics from the six dragons of the worlds that each represent an element color to gain access to a place called the Sea of Eden where Lynx, Kid, and Fate already are. This Sea of Eden is the same location of the Dead Sea in its parallel world. After fighting each dragon to earn their elemental colored relic and getting access to the Sea of Eden, we first need to get rid of our panther identity, and so we obtain the other world's dragon tier, the same artifact that Lynx used in the first place, and then head back to Fort Dragonia to finally look like Surge once again.
There, that feels so much better. Now that we look like who we are, it's off to the Sea of Eden and into a futuristic city aptly named Chronopolis. Here we have more tie-in connections to the events of Chrono Trigger, including the details on Lavos and Fate. It's here that the showdown ensues between Lynx and Fate, Lynx being the incarnation of Fate that we learn, the supercomputer entity that's bent on protecting humanity, although we don't know this at this point. Upon defeating Fate, Kid drops a major knowledge bomb on us. She tells us that Chronopolis was sucked into the past alongside the parallel world of dinosaurs, again from Chrono Trigger, it's the reptiles. Fate split the Dragon God, leader of those dinosaurs, into six elements that you interact throughout the game as the six Dragon Gods. With Fate dead, the dragon's true intentions are revealed and steal the frozen flame, rise an island into the sky now referred to as Terra Tower, and reform themselves back into the dragon god. Poor Kid, who seems to be at the center of all misfortune, once again is in trouble as she falls into a coma. Okay, taking one last break from the story, I want to touch on a low point for the remaster, which is the performance. Chances are, if you've been considering this game and looking at reviews, you can't escape the current state of performance. The frame rate is not improved from the original, I guess maybe to keep some authenticity, but it also drops much lower in certain areas of the game, making it actually worse than the original which was released over 20 years ago. It's sadly inexcusable. The remaster took 20 years and there's no reason to have rushed it at this point either. That said, while it can be frustrating at times, it's also not ruined by it either. If you had interest in the upgraded models, the textures, this might be the best solution, and who knows, perhaps they'll patch it in. Let's just hope it doesn't take another 20 years to do so. Okay, back to the story in the final spoiler alert. We're getting to the end. Hold on to your hats as the story really starts to ramp up now. We learn that Surge, years ago, was attacked by a panther demon, and his father tried to take him to an island to get healed, only to be blown off course by an entity called Shala that then fused with Lavos inside the planet. Yes, Lavos, the destruction of the planet and final boss of Chrono Trigger, is inside the planet now. They land at Chronopolis, where Surge interacts with the frozen flame for his father to help him heal his wound. This whole thing prevents Fate from being able to use the Frozen Flame for its own purposes and the Dragon Gods coerce Lynx into stealing the flame for them. It turns out that Lynx used the Dragon Tear to switch bodies with Surge to trick the Chronopolis defenses so as to gain access to the Frozen Flame. After using the Chrono Cross, yes, there is an item called the Chrono Cross in the game which also acts as the seventh element as well, and the Masamune Sword from Chrono Trigger fame to bring Kid out of her coma, we're off to Terra Tower to learn more. It's here that the Prophet of Time is revealed to be Balthasar from Chrono Trigger. 
Balthazar, wise to the entire workings of fate, the Dragon God, and the Frozen Flame, orchestrates a master plan called Project Kid, and it's revealed that through that project, a clone of the same shallow that feels with Lavos is in fact, dramatic pause, Kid. At the top of Terra Tower, we're greeted by the Dragon God, who needs his own battle, as if we didn't have enough dragon fights already thus far. And once we do, Balthazar shares that the Dragon God is really only illusion or some such thing of this world, and that it's here that we're given the Time Egg. We take this Time Egg to the beach from the very beginning of the game where we first experience the world dimension change and use it to enter another place called the Darkness Beyond Time, where we then have the final battle of the game to restore the timeline and the dimensions. It's the melded form of Shala and Lavo, simply known as the Time Devourer. There's quite a few endings to the game, and I'm not going to spoil any of them, but if you've been paying attention to the clues about the elements of the Chrono Cross while playing, there's two possible endings that you can get on your first playthrough, with many more achievable ones in a New Game Plus experience. Wow, now that's what I call a great RPG story. As I made this episode, I put in quite a bit of time to play through this multiple times, and it's really given me an opportunity to reflect on my experiences with this game over the years. In retrospect, my very initial reaction to the game back in August of 2000 was way too hasty, and my misguided disappointment about the connection to Chrono Trigger was, at best, wildly off base. I had come in expecting the next adventure of Chrono and his friends, jumping around the time continuum, and instead we got something very unexpected. The truth is, though, that the story of Chrono Cross, especially when combined with the events of Chrono Trigger, make for some of the best storytelling in the golden age of RPGs, and that's saying a lot. My advice is, for those that may have had the same first reaction as myself, would be that this remaster, now arguably on the most approachable system of all time, might be the perfect chance to really discover this gem. Of course, I know that many, many of you have already beat me to the punch and recognize this for what it is, or maybe you still hate it. I'd love to know either way, so please put your comments down below. I really appreciate you all taking time from your busy schedules to come and talk retro gaming. So, as always, thank you for watching Retro Ranger. Mm -hmm.